Learn the Way of the Warrior with Budokan on Amigos, episode 389. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Amigos. I'm John. And I'm Aaron. And today, Aaron, we're going to be talking about Budokan. Mm. Now, Aaron, you have a uh, you have some experience in the martial arts. That is true. Tell me, when did you start? When did you start your martial arts career, and how old were you when you finished your martial arts career? Well, it's never truly finished. That's true. I'm a lifelong practitioner of the dark arts. I've heard that. And the martial arts. I do both. <laughs> I do the dark arts when I get bored. Uh, I started. I'll tell you. I went down in sixth grade. So sixth right grade. Your wheelhouse there. Mm-hmm. So what is it? About, about eleven. About eleven, twelve yeah. years old. And I was I, uh, formally out of my dojo b- at high school a- age. So about so, 11 to 14 is when it went down. F- yeah, four, yeah, exactly. That's yeah. exactly right. So three years of martial arts I did training. Well, four years. and Four, maybe five, maybe six, somewhere in that ballpark. But I did I did study to the rank of the third degree brown belt. Yes, now, yes. Uh, that and a, and a nickel will get you a cup of coffee, as they say, because uh, uh, ultimately... Uh, I got mad at the school I went to, and then I was gone. So it is what it is. Now, it's funny to think that Luke has studied. We just put Luke back into jiu-jitsu this week. So oh. He, he's actually been uh, practicing jiu-jitsu longer than I was actually practicing karate. So it's kind of neat. And Luke entered the adult class uh, Wednesday. So my little 13-year-old buddy went in there with these enormous killers, 30 guys in here, these mm-hmm. big guys. Where and, is the where is this uh, dojo? The new school we're going to is a it's, it's a sports complex across from the Hurricane Park. Oh yeah, uh, and uh, uh, it's not seen Gracie Jiu Jitsu because mm-hmm. there is no Gracie Jiu Jitsu here anymore, unfortunately. But they are getting it done, so it's good. I was happy to see them. I think martial arts is important for a kid. Absolutely, you know. I'm now a- you you you've actually been doing your. Uh, uh, stuff for quite a while, Ham. How many years so, have been now since you've been in? Well, I started the same age that you did. Yeah. I started in about sixth grade, and I went up to actually. You and I are very similar in terms of uh, how long we spent in our middle slash high school years. Yeah. When I got about halfway through high school, I decided that band was going to be my thing, and uh, and I dropped everything else: baseball, martial arts, everything else, and so. Uh, and, uh, so I, I did the old Taekwondo karate thing. Uh, and then, uh, when I moved to Newport news, Virginia, uh, oh, for some reason I became interested in, uh, Iaido sword martial arts, yeah. you know, how old was this? And this was when I was 26, right. 27, something like that. And I've pretty much been going straight since then. Yeah. So uh, good, good while. I, uh, I practiced in Newport news. I did a little bit of Iaido or Iaido and Kendo. <laughs> Then when I moved to Korea, I studied Heidon Gumdo, oh. and I uh, got a black belt in Heidon Gumdo. Uh, and then when I moved back here, I went through, actually I went through a long period of time where I didn't do anything. And then uh, about five or six years ago, I started up with Eido again, and uh, I am currently a second degree black belt in Eido, and uh, hopefully will be competing in the national Eido championships in Richmond, Virginia in the middle of July. Let me ask you a question. This is slightly off topic, but I, you know, I don't know if you noticed this. We share that the Amigos YouTube channel I access, so Bo can always tell what I've been into. Mm-hmm. And for the past week, I've been into Japanese capsule hotels. Yes, I have right. noticed that. Now, I noticed something on the video I want to ask you about, because you have a long, you spent a long time in Asia, in various Asian countries. Mm-hmm. They had a, uh, you know, the Japanese are famous for their high-tech toilets. Yes. All right. And they had a button on the toilet, and all, uh, or near the toilet, and all the button does is just make the flushing sound of a toilet. Mm-hmm. Are you familiar with this concept? Oh, yeah. And, so you, and why is that? Because you don't want to waste water, but you also want to mask any sort of unsavory sound. That's that right. That's what, that's what I, I yeah. thought. That's, but I've never heard that before. Yeah. It, seemed, it seemed strange. You know, in ancient times, when the princess would use the toilet, they'd have, uh, they'd have servants pouring water from glass into glass to mask those sounds. It seems like you'd want to stay in the bathroom if somebody was doing that. You know, like you're near a fountain, you sort of make you want to go. Yeah. Also, that's... <laughs> What an odd tidbit you've got there. Listen, I got lots of tidbits. So, and actually, we've went backwards in bathroom technology 
way back How in the so? States. Oh, yeah. We know, well, I mean, we we escaped, you know, the outdoor toilet not that long ago yeah. compared to, you know. Oh, well, some of us just got there in the past couple of years, <laughs> right. in fact. You know, it's funny to look at these capsule hotels and stuff because I look at the street, and I was going to ask this too, since again, this is sort of plays in. You were in Korea, you were in Japan. These places look immaculate to me. And they also seem like there's a, there's a, I, don't know, I guess, a, a trust amongst your fellow citizens to not do shady things. I mean, and by that, I mean, like, you're not going to take, you're going to take one free thing, not all the free things. You're going to, you're going to, you're not going to, like, uh, bums aren't going to walk into the foot wash that's located on the street beside the hotel, stuff like that. Is that, am I off base here? No, I mean, Japan and to a lesser extent, Korea is a very, you know, it's a very, it's the opposite of an individualistic society. Mm -hmm. Everyone is trained from a very early age to be part of the whole mm -hmm. and to follow the rules. And that's why you have so little, you know, crime, so little, and especially in, in Japan. In Korea, you do have more littering, but in Japan, I've been to Japan three or four times, and every time I go, no matter where I go, you never see any trash on the street. Yeah. You know, it's just that you see kids, and in Korea, this is this way too, you see kids that are in kindergarten walking home after cram school at 10, 11, 12 o'clock at night, unaccompanied. Hmm. So it's, it's, it's a totally different world over there. Let me ask you one last question here. Cap the capsule hotel, which if you don't know what that is, it's these hotels that just have basically your room is the size of you sleeping in like a, a like a almost like a coffin sized room. It's bigger than some that. Some of them are quite nice. Actually. Yeah. Listen, I'd love to get in one of these things. Mm -hmm. Could we do this? Could we and you start one of these in the states? Could we put? Could that? Could you have that concept in the United States? Well, I think it would be a hard sell. I think it would be a hard sell because I don't, because hotels, like if you look at what those hotel co hotels cost, they're not like 25 bucks a night. And we've already got your red roof in. It's going to yeah. give you a normal room for 50 bucks a night. But you get like some, a lot of extra accoutrement at these places because mm -hmm. they're, they're built for you to go out of the capsule. They're very service oriented. Yeah. There. I was stunned. Yeah. And yeah. they have one trained. Mm -hmm. I love this stuff. I think I'd love to see what happened over here, but I'm not sure. I will say America that the, the hospitality industry in both Korea and Japan blows the United States states away yeah. you have to spend big big bucks to get the level of service that you get at a basic level place over there yeah well but on the other hand we got the super bowl we, we got, got the super bowl up, yeah yeah know, so absolutely that's, all, that's that's what we got that mm -hmm. but yeah we're big fat impolite jerks yeah america america aaron budicon let's talk about it shall we good idea Good tune, Boat. Absolutely. So, Budokan, this game was released in 1989 by Electronic Arts. You know, I was thinking, Aaron, we talk a lot about the Japanese studios. We talk a lot about the European studios. Yeah. You know, uh, at times I've been somewhat dismissive of the European studios. I don't know if you've noticed that. I before. have occasionally. I'll catch that drift. Yeah. Um, but we don't really talk about the American studios too much because the American studios were not nearly as prolific as the as the European studios on the Amiga. On the Amiga. That's yeah. what I'm talking about yeah. on the Amiga. But we did have studios. Electronic Arts. Name some other American studios. Can you name any offhand? Well, Activision. Yeah, would be one uh, that comes to mind. Uh, uh, I'm trying to think of what were the big uh, producers of American-sized games back in those days. You know, well, I, you've got you've got your you got Activision. I mean, Cinemaware was American. Yep, Cinemaware. So one. Okay, but the other two big ones are Sierra. Sure, Sierra. Sierra and Lucas Arts. Right. Yeah. You know, I yeah, would yeah, I would yeah. put those in there, um, and then whoever did Ultima, who was do, who who put that out was, Ultima? Uh, Roger. That was a uh, Gary Richard Gary. Yeah. Uh, uh, Origins. Origins. Studios. Yeah, yeah. And, and so, you also had Bullfrog and uh, this Bullfrog's is before they all got eaten up. Oh, is it? Yeah, okay, well, Peter Molyneux. Oh, uh, yeah, you're right. Um, but anyway. You know, I was thinking, what differentiates Sid Myers, My bad. What differentiates the American studios just in wide swaths from the European studios? And I think one word sums it up: quality. Oh. Okay, this Don't is very everybody. I'm just saying that whenever we cover, you know, a game from EA, from I'm talking about from this time period, yeah, from Cinemaware, from Sierra, these are big budget. 
big spectacle, big packaged games. Uh, yeah. You know, we didn't, you know, the, the computer home entertainment market of the 80s in the United States was a big budget enterprise. Um, now, why do you think that is? I think just that it's a different, well, it's a different market for starters. I think part of the reason this is different is we didn't have the budget thing going on that they had overseas, for example. And so uh, people expected more for the $50 or $40 they spent for this game. Mm -hmm. And they also, uh, since a lot of the software companies you mentioned would would put their stuff on uh, many different machines, there was a certain bit of, there was a certain bit of, uh, making them easier to get into, maybe even easier to play, mm -hmm. something that would work on a console, something that would work on multiple computers. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so I'd say there was part of it was, was that. Although, I mean, obviously, they released a lot of different stuff for different computers over, over in Europe, but I'd say the budget market is probably the biggest difference. I'd mm -hmm. say it was just we didn't have that. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. I just yeah. wanted to get your thoughts on that. So getting to the game here, this game, of course, released in 1989. This is um, was designed by a guy named Michael Kosaka. Okay. Right. Michael Kosaka was a real Renaissance man. Okay. He did everything you can possibly do in the computer industry. Uh, he was a producer. Uh, he was a designer. He did art. Uh, he didn't do music, so I guess he didn't do everything. But here's some of his his bona fides. Okay. All right. Read them out. He produced Nuclear and Soviet Strike. These are the games that came after Jungle Strike and Urban Strike. Okay. Okay. He was lead designer of the uh, somewhat important title Madden NFL '94. Oh yeah, that's pretty important. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he. Oh yeah. By the way, he designed and programmed Skate or Die. Oh. Okay. Okay. He also did the art for Jordan versus Bird, Crystal Castles, and was the art director on the original Rogue. Oh, there was art in the original Rogue. This is this was the original PC Rogue, so it wasn't the ASCII. You know, <laughs> okay. it was the it was the you know the the tiles. Right. You know. Okay. This guy. Yeah. Okay. Uh, hey, look, I've heard of all those. So yeah, I'm surprised that we we haven't heard about this guy before. Mm. The guy is Michael Kasaka, but most important for this game. Uh, he is an uh, Michael is an Aikido instructor, or at least was when this came out. Oh, and uh, he is a Nidon, a second degree black belt okay. in Aikido. Okay, so he's your boy. There's not a lot of uh, of martial arts game programmers, I think, that actually are martial arts practitioners. And I think as we talk about this game, you'll see some of those. Well, you'll see some of those things play out. Now, was he the designer? He was the game designer for this. That That's makes correct. perfect sense. That's yeah, correct. Yep, there you go. Okay, as you can tell. So it wasn't just a ham and egg that walked out. Someone right. knew something about martial arts. Right. Now, the programming of this game was done by Raymond Toby. Uh, he didn't do a whole lot. Uh, he did a game called Sky Fox. Are you familiar with Sky Fox? Yeah, I'm, yes, I am familiar okay, with Okay, I haven't heard of that before. Yeah. He also did a game called Blazing Dragons, but he, he's, he doesn't have a lot of credits, or at least he didn't on Moby. Uh, the Amiga version of Budokan was done by a guy named Mike Schwartz. Him, um, I've heard of. And uh, he did uh, he did the Mega Drive version of uh, Marble Madness. He programmed oh. uh, Dick Tracy, and Ooh. probably his his most infamous credit not really infamous, but he programmed Chase the Chuck Wagon, which was <laughs> one of those early <laughs> mail away titles that's sort of a rarity on so the VCS. So this guy's been around for a while. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, the music and sound effects were done by Rob Hubbard. Rob Hubbard's oh, wow. done a billion million yeah, things. He's the man. Just a couple things I, I got here. He did Skate or Die, Thanatos, Jet Set Willie, and Nighttime, as well as Jerry the Germ goes body popping. You can't forget about <laughs> that's that. That's a new one. Already. Yeah. That had the great the great orchestral <laughs> pieces that were involved in now. That's right. That's right. So, Budokan. What is this game? Aaron, how would you describe Budokan? I'd say Budokan is the uh, martial arts equivalent of something like a uh, summer game. That's what it reminds me of. You get to try it. You are a, a very versatile martial artist who gets to practice and compete with a varying degree of weapons or no weapon before attempting to do the ultimate, which is go to the big martial arts tournament at the Budokan and try to beat all the other masters to attain the ultimate prize. Yeah, I think that's a great that's a great summation of this game. So uh, Budokan is a, a martial arts game that covers many different uh, uh, styles slash weapon systems of, of combat. So you've got karate, your open hand combat, 
Kendo, where you're using the uh, the bamboo sword, uh, the nunchaku, the the old nunchucks, numchucks as we call Num them. Chuck. That's right, yep. and the bow. Okay, uh, your opponents uh, when you when you fight them, they also have some additional weapons that they can use against you. But those are the ones that you are able to use in the game. Yeah, tonfa, throwing stars. Yeah, There's, they got the uh, some cooler ones. Some cooler stuff. Yeah. yeah. Now, um. In this game, uh, you uh, this is uh, to me this this uh, was immediately it, it immediately reminded me of Skate or Die when you start sure. this game because you start the game in sort of an overworld where you are able you look like you're in a Japanese a traditional Japanese courtyard. It's very sort of zen looking. You got a little pond there, and you've got uh, you've got five sort of um, Japanese style homes, and each one you can go and you can practice a different, uh, you know, one of those five things, either karate or bow or nunchucks or whatever. And so when you go into one of those places. You go into one of those training halls, then you can go and and you practice. Okay, now you can either practice by yourself. Or you can practice against an opponent, and the yeah. opponents have three levels. So why would you want to practice yourself? You know, well, actually, this is a, this is a, a great thing because this game, uh, the move set in this game is much much different than almost any other fighting game. Um, I, can you think of an of a fighting game that has a similar sort of control mechanic? The, the only one that comes to mind is is, is Panza Kickboxing. Yes, uh, where mm-hmm. and, uh, the one thing Panza has on this game really sort of trumps Panza in almost every way. But one of the things it doesn't have is what Panza does is your ability to go through and and set the, your moves up and sort of customize your guy. But, I mean, of course, in a game like this, you, that wouldn't make as much sense as a Panza. But, yes, this is a game where you, uh, you're you moving forward and moving backwards and ducking, really, are your movements and, and jumping. But everything else is tied to a button press and a, and a direction on the joystick to get... Uh, it's sort of like if you played Karate Champ without another joystick, if they somehow worked it up. That's right. what it reminds now, me of. Now, why did they have to do this? They had to do this because they wanted... The designer Michael, he wanted to put in as many moves as possible. Yeah. But you're limited with an eight-way joystick and one button. Yeah. And so uh, each character, each different style that you practice has a. I mean, this is a mind-boggling number of moves. Thirty-four moves. Yeah. Each character has thirty-four moves, and you accomplish these things by basically pressing the joystick and the button in any conceivable direction you can think of, or a combination of yeah, directions. Most people won't ever even see the combinations until you actually get to the tournament and the computer's doing them on you. And then right. you'll be like, oh, that what is that? Right. And so the when <laughs> when Mike was designing this game, he wanted to uh he wanted to confer upon the the player this is what learning a martial art is really like. It's not like playing Kung Fu Master where you go in and you merely start beating up guys and being awesome. Yeah. You know, to master Budokan, you have to put in the same work in the dojo as if you were practicing a martial art in real life. It is a it is not easy. I would not call the control system in this game easy to master. Here's the funny thing. All right. I've played this on and off over the years, as you know, mm-hmm. and I think you have too. And I jumped back into it this week, and it was like I had never left because I'd gotten so familiar with the controls from the last couple times I played it that now, so I came in and was instantly killing it mm-hmm. and was streaking through the tournament until I hit a roadblock. Uh, and but uh, uh, it is one; it's it the it's so unique to this game that you'll remember it, I think. Yeah. Because there's not, there, like I said, there aren't very many games that, that will have you do the things that you do in this game. Right. And, you know, in, in the manual, he talks about how when you are practicing either on your own or when you're practicing against a uh, another opponent, you need to always anticipate, you need to fight defensively, which is not something that you often have to do in martial arts yeah. games. And and he talks about, you know, he says like, you know, if, 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 he, if, he, if your opponent spins a kick to your forehead, then drop to a crouch and kick his leg out from under him. If he throws a punch to your solar plexus, parry the blow with a mid-range block. And these are all things that you can actually do in the game with this control system. Now, the game has a um, the game has an interesting sort of um, set of meters at the top of the screen. Okay, and so you've got two meters. You've got uh, that kind of tick down. You have a key meter and a stamina meter. 
Okay, so uh, the stamina bar, uh, what that does is that indicates your current strength. So the longer the bar, the more stamina you have. Now, what weighs, what brings down your stamina? Well, you would think, well, getting hit does because that's how fighting games work, but that's not all. In this game, if you perform what the game deems are difficult moves, that also wears down your stamina. Now, to me, that's cool. Because just like in real life, if you go for some sort of like jump crescent kick, yeah, I remember the the the, the only tournament that I fought in as an adult was a couple of years ago, yeah, and we did three one minute rounds, and I was dying not because I was beaten up, but because I was not used to being full on intense battle mode for that yeah. long of time. And you could imagine doing that with a weapon, right? Like I was thinking when, when I, I I liked the bow in this and the kendo stick too, and. You can imagine jumping, lunging forward, jumping, and swinging someone's head over and over. It's going to drain you quickly. Right. Now, in addition to this being a bar, it's also color-coded. So you can look up and see your status at a glance. So if your bar is green, then you have full strength, okay? And that's where you want to be because your moves are really, really quick. If you're yellow, you have about 60% stamina loss, and your reaction time is going to be slow, okay? So what you really want to do once you get down to that yellow mode is just kind of move away from your opponent and try and get some try and get some stamina because you're not going to be able to pummel them into submission. You're going to get hit. If you are at 80% stamina loss, then you're red. You're red. You're very close to exhaustion, and uh, you're just going to have to like just take it easy. Okay, so that's the stamina meter. Okay, now the key meter is a it, your key meter basically. You know how would you define? You're you're a big practitioner of the old martial arts film. Well, yeah, well, yeah. well they, they talk about key a lot in those. Well, Tell us about it. Yeah, yeah. To explain key or chi to somebody is a difficult task. Yes, because it's, it's a spiritual energy mm-hmm. that's sort of like the force. Right. Right. And, and right. In this game, the more of it you have, the more lethal your blows are going to be, mm-hmm. basically. Uh, it's funny. Uh, I was mentioning going to the tournament. There's a, I fought this old guy with a bow staff in a tournament. He always gives me trouble. And you will be punishing this guy, beating the tar out of him. But he won't shoot. He won't do anything for a while. And then he'll land a couple blows on you that are brutal. That's what causes this. He let his meter run up on you. He'll land these blows. So if you go in there and just ragtag a guy, you'll think you're doing great, but you're unless you can blitz him and get him and get him out of there, that you know often they will come back on you because you weren't doing that much damage, right? Because you weren't giving yourself enough time to set up properly and stuff, right? This is not a game where I mean, listen, there are different tactics to different fighters and to different tactics to different weapons, you know. And so sometimes you have to go in there and just say the heck with it and go. But often, giving yourself a little bit of time in between moves to figure out what's happening helps. Yeah, and the way that key works in this game is that the more the 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 more you it's a, the longer you stay in a match without attacking, the more key you collect. Yeah. So this is the this is the, uh, the 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 typical sort of you know kung fu thing where you got the the bad guys throwing all these punches and you just keep on bobbing and weaving until you finally unload the monster yeah. attack on them. So. You've got a key bar to deal with, and you know if you if you when you attack, you lose half your key for the blow. Okay, and if you get struck, you lose half your key. So the the key meter is constantly filling up and going down. The same with the stamina. It's a little confusing having to keep track of two meters. I'm not sure if that was completely necessary, but I know why they did it because you know key is sort of part of like you said the spiritual component of your I, I your martial like arts. It. I'll, and I'll explain why. Every fighting game has a power meter. Right. And sometimes they have a power meter and a meter be built up for a special move. This doesn't have that. This is a game where this, what it does is make you block more. Mm -hmm. It makes you fight more defensively. It gives you the option of doing that. In a lot of games, you don't have the option to do that. And in this game, you do. I can tell you that if you hold off for a while before you attack... You can do a ton of damage, and it's also it's really cool to land that big shot. Oh yeah, you know, and then and then you and if you lose half, you're still going to land an, another nasty shot with it. Right. And this game, unlike a lot of fighting games, uh, blocking is not only blocking uh, uh, beneficial for your key, but it's ne- in a lot of ways it's necessary. Uh, and the blocking this works well. It's very realistic. That's something else, I guess. That goes without saying. This game is one of your more realistic martial arts games because 
you do get tired in an event like this. And sometimes uh, in Japan, if we were in Japan, it'd be called the chi would be called burning spirit. Whatever you've got, sometimes you do get that flash of adrenaline in a match, where you're really going to come forward and go hell on wheels and try to go at somebody. And this is a good simulation of that, mm-hmm. I think. Now, this is a point for being a sort of martial arts simulation. It also has a, a point-based uh, structure whenever you make attacks. This is almost sort of an arcade-like uh, point structure where when you kick or punch somebody, you get a certain number of points depending on a certain number of factors. The, yeah. the point system in this game is sort of complicated. Um, it's but odd. Yeah, and you can, you can, for example, you can do the exact same move twice and not get the same amount of points yeah. for it. Uh, the points just show up underneath your fighter, just like you were playing, you know, an arcade game or something like that. I thought that was a little bit weird. Um, I don't know if I would have included points, but they are handy in knowing what strikes are the most effective. Uh, you know, sometimes if you land like a really high point attack, that means that you're really doing damage. But again, your opponent has a stamina bar and a key bar, so you can keep track of where they are too. I will say that uh, there are lots of little touches in this game that I really enjoy. For example, when you go into each one of the uh, Japanese uh, houses, the, 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 the dojos, when you go into each dojo, each dojo is different. You see an animated background, and sometimes you'll see one of the, I can't remember the Japanese name for it, but there's a little alcove where you might have a, a scroll or a sword or something like that. And they have the plaque that sort of identifies what you're in there for right. written in the background. Right. I like, love that stuff. Uh, to me, that that's great. That's yeah. great. The so, little touches in this, I mean, on the main overhead screen, you can sort of walk over to the pond if you mm-hmm. want to. You can also, there's a there's a guy, in a, in, there's a master in the big hut, the big house. You can ask him for wisdom. And he doesn't just give you some kind of fortune teller baloney. He actually has some, he gives you some pretty good, I mean, it's, it's, it's based in sort of a folklorish way he says stuff, but it's actually, it's not crap. It's right. like good stuff. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Okay. So all of this training is to prepare you for the, what the name of the game is, Budokan. Right. Okay. So you, when you feel like you are ready to enter the tournament, you simply walk to the Budokan. Now I've seen pictures of the Budokan before and it is not laid out like it is in this game. There are no. not four dojos <laughs> that, that, that flank it, but the uh, the Budokan, of course. Let's well, let's talk a little bit about what the Budokan is. Okay? okay, so you mean the building itself? The building All itself. Right. Okay, so this is a, a this is an indoor sporting arena uh, that is located in Tokyo. It was originally built for uh, the judo competition when uh, when the Tokyo had the games in 1964. It was the first year that judo was a sport in yeah. the Olympics. It's hard to believe that judo has only been part of the Olympics since 1964. But there you go. So um, you know. It was ostensibly built for the Olympics, but uh, in just a couple years after the Olympics, they started having musical guests come in. Oh, yes. And uh, the first, do you, do you recall the first musical guest to host at the Budokan? Uh, the first? I don't remember the first. That would be the Fab Four. Oh, what was it? Yes. The very first ones. That's a pretty good kickoff. 1966. Uh, they are, uh, and, of course, there are famous stories about uh, certain conservative members of Japanese society uh, protesting, saying that the, uh, the, the, the judo arena should be held as, as sort of a more of a, a sacred site that's only for, you know, sorts of uh, martial arts competitions. Uh, boy, they those, shouldn't... Guys, those guys were disappointed after the many years of yes. weird stuff. Yeah. Because but... the Beatles were nothing compared. Some of the stuff that's exactly, gone the exactly, and of course now, I mean, everybody plays the Budokan. It's on, it's on your standard leg of your yeah, tour. Cheap trick went there. Yeah, well, like Adam Ant and all those guys. Th- there have been tons and tons of, of albums that have been blah 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 live at Budokan. Uh, Blur has been there. Brian Adams, Bob Dylan, Eric Clapton, uh, Cheap Trick, uh, Kiss played Budokan. Yeah, and of course, who could forget? Ringo Starr's appearance. Listen, they only have the biggest and the best. You know I'm a big Ringo fan. They also host uh, a many a wrestling show. New Japan Pro Wrestling plays Budokan all the time. Mm -hmm. Uh, And uh, it's a, uh, I would call it a mid-sized Japanese arena. It's nothing like, say, Tokyo Dome, which is like, a small town mm-hmm. that's under a dome, mm-hmm. but, the, but you can do pretty well in the Budokan. Now, getting back to the game, when you enter the Budokan or when you approach the Budokan, you get this really beautiful cut scene yeah. of you walking towards the Budokan. And I mean, it is a beautiful, beautiful piece of pixel art. Uh, it shows the pond on the side, the cherry trees are in blossom. Uh, it's just a beautiful picture and they really get you pumped up. You really feel like, all right, I'm going for it. Yeah. I'm going to do it. 
Okay. I, there's so much I love about the actual tournament in this game. Yeah, yeah. So tell us, Aaron. Tell us about the tournament. Well, so you're in a. It's I would guess what you call it a mixed, uh, mixed martial arts tournament. And that was weapons. Yeah. It had weapons. So Not something you see very often. No, I've never seen it actually. It's blood sport or something. <laughs> but uh, and so you're gonna you're gonna tussle with people that use the basic abilities that you have access to, which as you mentioned were karate and kendo and bow staff and nunchuck. But you also are gonna have people, like I said, that have Tonfa and uh, uh, and, Nagita, and, 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 or are they and, the, 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 the chain the, stall, the chain, uh, what is the, the, you got the, what is like the thing on the end of the spear? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah that's right. And then you also have, of course, there's the ninja chick that, that's in there. And so, but one thing I love about this, yes, you're right, you walk up to the beautiful arena, and it's just this animation of your guy, he take kind of looks at it like, oh, I'm, I'm, it's like I've arrived, mm-hmm. you know, and then. Once you go in, you're treated to a uh, it's sort of like almost like a punch out screen where it shows you the guy you're going to be fighting and it's got a little blurb about him. And it's great because it gives these guys uh, personalities, yeah. you know, you, yeah. and you really feel like, hey, I'm actually going to I'm going to fight somebody at this Budokan. It's going to be awesome. And then they've rendered the arena quite nice. It looks like a big like a big karate tournament. You mm-hmm. would just like you'd expect it to look like. And then. Uh, the fight begins. Now, here there are multiple things I like about this. For one, like we mentioned, you're going to fight people you haven't seen before, but you're also, the, the their, their description gives you a window into their style. Like the first guy you fight, he's a sushi-eating champion. He's just sort of a goof. He's the glass Joe of the Budokan, right? And then you fight him, and then, as you, and by the way, these guys all look different. They don't look like your guy, okay? Mm-hmm. They look like other people. Mm-hmm. This is not a palette swap. This is not a palette swap. This one guy has this incredibly huge like, hat you mm-hmm. fight. And when you beat him, you knock that hat mm-hmm. off. You're like, yeah. You fight uh, ladies. The, you fight a, uh, the old. There's a guy that has no rank. It shows you their rank and stuff. There's a guy that has no rank. He's lived for like on a desert island for uh, honing his skills mm-hmm. with the chucks, I believe it is. Then you fight the grand old master who's a, a, a bow staff legend, you know, and it gives you hints. He, like, here's what's going to happen, you know, and then you get in there and you tussle with them. And you can, if you lose, you can continue, but if you lose too many times, you get knocked down a peg. And mm-hmm. you got to go back and fight the other guy again. Right, right. And so you are in the tournament, you're only allowed to use any one martial art a maximum of four times. Yes, that's something else I like. So, because at the bottom of the screen, it allows you to pick which martial art you're going to use before you go into the match. This is very strategic because if you're going to fight, for example, I never I never fight a guy with a what, that has a bow staff with anything less than a kendo stick or a bow staff because he'll have that long range mm-hmm. on you. Now, a better fighter can do it. And on the flip side, if you're fighting someone with a, uh, with a chucks, you know, you probably want to use a bow. They're going to have an easier time. If they're open hand, then maybe that's when you use your you open also, hand. You also have to weigh, too, you know, the, the earlier matches are easier. Right. You can blow through the early matches without much difficulty. You don't want to use your best weapon, the thing that you know the best on these. You don't want to waste them on these early games. And I've never beaten the tournament. No, me neither. No, either. no. How far have, do you know how far I got to, been? like, the fifth or sixth. I got farther than yeah. I thought I would. yeah. And I mean, I really, I worked at. I think I could beat this thing mm-hmm. given enough time. And the reason you lose goes back to the very reason you talked about practicing. Mm-hmm. Again, a quick example, okay? The nunchuck guy, the first guy you come up with the chucks, he's going to walk up to you, and you're going to try to stay at length. And when he gets near you, he'll twirl the chucks, which it, you can't do that until you figure out how, right. right? And so it's important. And so what that means is he's hitting you multiple mm-hmm. times. The bow staff guy, if he gets inside on you or you jump in on him, you're screwed because he takes that bow staff and twirls mm-hmm. it on you and drains you. And this is some kind of arcade, you know, fireball crap. This is like a move you could actually do. Right. And it's cool. And you, even when you lose, you're like, well, you, you, I screwed up and here's how. I know mm-hmm. what I did wrong. And so when you're playing the tournament, you're actually building up your own skill uh, and you're getting to fight these guys that are doing stuff that even the guys in the dojo, unless you put on the highest level, aren't doing. These guys, like I said, you're also fighting guys that you haven't got to practice against before, too. Everything about it is great. I love the whole setup for it. The, the fact that you can't just camp one type of style. It makes you work all the styles. 
I like the crowd. I like the sound. I like all of it. I think yeah. it's all great. The music, the whole nine yards. This is really one of those total package games. It I is. mean, getting back to the manual, not only does the manual tell you how to play the game, but the manual also gives you complete histories of each one of the weapons. It gives you some general martial arts history. And this is stuff that's handy for yes. once. Yeah. Yeah. And it talks about, and this is the kind of thing that I love about video games. Because if I was a kid and I was intra and I bought this game, this is the kind of game that would make me want to try martial arts out for real yeah and i love i think that's great because that's the best kind of edutainment yeah you know when you're you're you've got a great game that shows you a realistic portrayal of an activity and it inspires you to try that thing out for real and it's ref- i mean listen i love fighting games you know that mm-hmm. and it's a this is i would not this is more like what i would call sort of like panza this is more like a fighting simulator yeah it's similar game. to Panza. It's similar to Karate Champ. And and so what you get here is, and you can see why I can see why this game isn't like talked about in hushed tones, mm-hmm. like Street Fighter mm-hmm. or something, or even an extra Karate Champ, mm-hmm. which I think this is leagues better than mm-hmm. leagues and leagues. Mm-hmm. It's slower. It's harder to pick up. It's uh, you're not just going to jump in it and go like you would so like IK Plus. This is a game you're gonna, it's it, it you got to load it off this, you got to walk to the thing, and you got to get the second player. Or whatever. It's not just like I mean, and really, what they could have done is made this a little more accessible in a fighting game way if they wanted to. That if there's a shortcoming, I think that's probably it. Well, as a two player game, I've played this. It's fun. This is not a two player game. It's yeah, one player no, you online. can play. No, 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 you can play two players. Absolutely, really, you can play one versus two. Yes, absolutely. I have. I I did oh, not yes. see that. I yes, did you not can see that. Okay. Play two players. Okay. I think what you could have done here with that. Is you could have given it a little more in that regard mm-hmm. to make it a lot. Now I can see why they didn't because it's not and probably the guy that made it didn't want it to be like that. But uh, what you've got here is something like you said. It's almost tranquil. It reminds you know what it reminds me of is when you sit down on Tony Hawk and you uh, and you just kind of roll around in the arena. That's what mm-hmm. the practice is in this. That's sort of how you feel. You're in there working out. But it, again, this is a little slow, but it's more realistic. It could have been a touch faster, I'll grant you. But I don't, I, there aren't very many complaints that I have about this one. Yeah. The music's tight. The graphics are tight. The gameplay's accessible, fun. Once you learn a little, it's. I think it's a great game. Well, we didn't get any Discord reviews this week, but I will tell you about what, how the magazines rated it. The magazines rated it pretty well. Oh. Uh, the average magazine score was 74. You know, I can definitely see why some people wouldn't think this was an A game because it is so sort of obtuse. Yeah. to approach, but uh, it got some good scores. Um, Amiga Format gave it an 80. Amiga Action gave it an 83. Uh, even Amiga Joker gave it a 74. Uh, the lowest score that it got was uh, CU Amiga, which didn't review it until 93. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, this, is, and they gave it a 35. They're idiots. So, yeah. Um, but... <laughs> there's no there's no time on earth that yeah. it's a 35. Yeah, yeah. So I, you know, uh, the folks on Lemon gave it a 7.62 to me this is an a game this is an a game yeah. it's not an a plus game you know it could be it's faster close. but it it's is great close. it and, is and great it, here's the thing i'm gonna say it this could be you could argue this this could be the best fighting game on the amiga and at least up to this point on the on the pc it's i mean it's top shelf mm-hmm. and uh, it's not a traditional arcade fighting game but you know that's the rub. If, and I think that's, again, that's what turns some people off on it. But I mean, I've never seen people come out and say bad, bad mouth. And right. I believe this got a Genesis release. It did. It, it got a Genesis release. And I don't remember it being real, real well received with mm-hmm. Genesis. But again, that's it's not the kind of game you would that that kind of crowd would, exactly. would accept. Exactly. It's a bummer. If you haven't tried this one, my God. I mean, really, you should really give this a shot. I mean, and go into it in the frame of mind that you would... Uh, something that's a simulation or something like that. Don't go into it like an arcade experience because that's not what you're going to get. Right. Are you a sketchy tech? Do you have the right tools for the job? Have there been incidents? Next time, don't try to fix it yourself. Send your broken Amiga to Retro Rewind. Get a full diagnostic, a reasonable estimate, and the peace of mind knowing that your machine is in the hands of real technicians with decades of experience and cutting-edge repair equipment. Save 10% off your repair with the promo code AMIGOS10. Thank you to 
RecordRewind.ca for supporting this episode. All right, Aaron, we're going to start things off with a uh, follow-up from last week, of course. We, uh, we talked about the uh, tragic news of Tyler Cox's death uh, last week. Uh, they, are, uh, they, have a, they are organizing the memorial service for Taylor, and they have launched a GoFundMe page. Uh, that you can go and you can help contribute to some of those funeral costs and uh, just uh, leave a nice message for his uh, for his memorial service. So if you are so inclined, you can head on over to the Amiga News subreddit and uh, click on that link there and uh, throw some cash their way and some good vibes. I know that they appreciate it. Yeah, uh, we mentioned last week the, uh, the loss of Taylor uh, passing away as, as a young man. Uh, he again a a very popular uh, person in the media community, and if you uh, feel so inclined, you can go over and donate a a, a few dollars uh, to his expenses here, and uh, I'm sure the family would appreciate it both. And uh, we hope everything uh, goes well, and uh, uh, they can move past this difficult time. It's tough, but uh, all we can do is you know walk on. Yeah. So there you go. All right, Aaron. Now we dive into some Amiga news this week. The Pi Storm 32. This thing has lit the internet literally on fire. It has. It has. And I have to say, uh, uh, you know, this is one of the things I've heard about. And, uh, and but I mean, we hear a lot about Buffy. We hear about all this stuff, uh, and and the and all the other wacky things. Terrible fire. This. I mean, there's so many of these things. And me and you, idiots, we don't mm-hmm. know what they're talking mm-hmm. about. So you know, when I get uh, when I'm perplexed. I like to lean on uh, Chris Edwards here and his uh, eclectic stylings, and he actually uh, gets a pie storm, installs a pie storm, tests a pie storm, and uh, I was real impressed with the pie storm. I guess is what I'm saying. Uh, it's a cheap gimmick. It's a cheap date. If you can get a uh, Raspberry Pi to stick on this thing, uh, man, I mean, it looked awful good. And I know some people in our Discord probably went out and bought these things. When I when I checked the website, they were not available at the mm. time. So I don't know how many of these have they have been sold, or maybe they weren't even maybe they weren't ready yet. Uh, I, you know, as with anything of this sort, uh, it may take a while before the kinks are are all worked out. But I will say, the this is one of those rare Amiga items where the price is somewhere in the atmosphere. I mean, it's a real good deal. Yeah. It's incredibly inexpensive. And the effects that it gives you are impressive. Uh, and Chris goes, I mean, I will say this, I'll watch this whole video. And again, this is me not knowing a whole lot about the, uh, the Pi Storm. Uh, and he goes in and runs tests before and after benchmarks, demos, and the difference is off the charts, mm-hmm. if I'm honest. So this is definitely one to keep your eye on. And uh, you definitely want to go over and check out Chris's video. He gave me the full scoop. This is the first person I saw that even mentioned having one of these. Now I've seen other people pop up. You know how these things sort of disseminate oh, yeah. amongst, mm-hmm. amongst the people. Mm-hmm. But uh, one thing you know when Chris is going in there, he'll tell you straight up if it's working out for him or not, which is what I like. So give this a look. And uh, if you happen to... Uh, Pick up one of these Pi Storms and install it. Drop us a note. Leave us a comment on the video. Let us know how it's going. Because I rarely boat do I buy anything. But I do have pretty much a stock Amiga 1200 in there. I could actually put something like this in that. And I can see a reason to have it. A mm-hmm. rare reason to have it. So, that much said, uh, uh, let us know what you think. And thanks to Chris for setting this thing up. Looks good. Aaron, our next story is comes to us from Happy Coding. I've heard of him. Tell me about what's going on here. So Happy, you know, uh, we love Happy. He, and we've known Happy now for a couple of years as he reached out to us about his uh, Asteroids project called the ZX. So what Happy's done here has put together a Midnight Brew Charity Digital Box Set. Ooh. Okay, what does that sound like? Well, there's a lot of words. There's a lot there. of words there. What you're getting here, this is a digital version of... Of the first Midnight Brew box set, it seems like Edmund should be involved in something like that, <laughs> uh, which includes uh, Roust, uh, uh, Asteroids RX, Shays Maxim, hey, hey, mm-hmm. uh, Nick, uh, Nixie the Glade Sprite, and Nixie and the Seeds of Doom. 
All high-resolution artwork is included. All proceeds, Boat, will be donated directly to help the victims of the earthquake in Turkey and Syria. Man, talk about a good cause. Let me tell you something. I, I don't like to be the downer guy, but this is a, 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 an event, a cataclysmic event on a world scale. Yeah. It's, it's, it's just the worst. It is. It's the worst. It cuts through... Uh, it all divides because the earthquakes don't care. Mm-hmm. And the people uh, down in Turkey and Syria are suffering. And if you can, if you can throw a couple bucks at Happy here, uh, at, at 10, you, I mean, throw them. These are, first of all, these are all, I've played three of the five games here and they're, and they're all gold. Mm-hmm. So throw them uh, 10 euros or 10 pounds, whatever you got, or more, if you can donate more. You know it's going to a good cause, and also you got to give Happy and his gang credit because they're giving this stuff away. He's this isn't the first time Happy's done a charity game. No. He's done several mm-hmm. of them because that's what you do. Yeah, you know, and and so I recommend to all of our ZX uh, fans out there, and I'm sure we're going to get to all these games. We already looked at a couple of them. Um, if you're a ZX fan. Uh, you know Happy's going to set you up. And if you're not a ZX fan or don't care, just give some money anyway to help the people over there out. The first thing I'm going to do tonight when I get home is to buy this thing. Let me tell you, let me tell you something. It's karma. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, at the bare minimum. Uh, and, and on this planet, we have our ups and downs, but this is we got to stick together when stuff like this happens. And you've got to, everything else, you got to throw it away. Uh, and the people over there need your help. And this is a great effort from Happy. I salute you, Happy, for putting this together. I now, think that's Aaron, all we got there, buddy. from the sublime to the ridiculous, if you refresh your page, maybe you will see it. I love the ridiculous boat. Birdie's Animal Kingdom. Oh, yeah. By yes. request. I demanded that this be included because <laughs> I wanted to see what it was. So, uh, Indie Retro News has a little piece here about Birdie's Retro Kingdom. Let's have a look at this boat since we're sitting here. Yeah, so this is a, uh, apparently, uh, this is one of those games that weren't. This was a, uh, this was going to come out. I, uh, in, um, well, it says it may have been released, but in very low numbers, doing to it being quite late into the Amiga 1200's life, and it's an educational title. Uh, it says that Birdie's Animal Kingdom scored rather average marks, which may have put off any potential users in an already shrinking market. So uh, this thing was a game that, if it was released, it was released in very low numbers. This is a chance for you to play it in all its edutainment glory. Aaron, it looks good, I, I will say. Because you, you were sort of poo-pooing this. You, the Animal Crossing maniac. That's true. And this, uh, listen, I've played some edutainment. Mm-hmm. You know, I own some edutainment devices of the house, mm-hmm. all right, stupidly. And the Brent is a big edutainment fan. So we've played, me and you have all played these. And this is beautiful. It looks, the graphics are stylized in a beautiful, gorgeous way. Mm-hmm. Listen, we've got to know what sound Horace makes. <laughs> and the only way you're going to know what sound a horse makes is to pick the correct noise. Yep. How are we going to learn this sort of stuff? You know, it's funny. Do you know in Thailand and like other countries, the animals make totally different noises according to how like they're like onomatopoeias? Really? You know, it's odd that here we are on the farm and I've seen a tiger, a lion, and a cobra. Come streaming in. What kind of farm is this? Look at that giant tarantula. What, <laughs> what sound does that make? That, it's the sound of me screaming as I run off. That must be this farm must be in Australia. A rider. How do they how do they not release this quality product yeah. right here? Average marks. Who was grading this thing? This looks like solid gold. So listen. Hop on over. I think you could the the info for this thing is sourced out on Indie Retro News, and just a plug here. I want to give two plugs. One is, actually, I gave three. One, I love Moby. We use it every week. It's gold. Mm-hmm. Two, Indie Retro News, we use that every week. It's gold. And three, we love our friends over at Lemon. Yes. Let them know. That's another place you could drop a buck or two. Mm-hmm. At the Lemon folks and at Indie Retro News, all of which are solid gold. People like us, your podcast community, without those, we'd be... We'd be reached around the dark, wiki style, and yeah. be all we had. And wiki, too, for that so, matter. So, I continue my story before you uh, oh, I'm cut sorry. me off. I didn't know you had a story. I'm sorry. So, Happy Coding points out, in France, dogs go gaff, gaff. Okay? Uh, in no. Yes. In Thailand, pigs go oot, oot. 
Really? Yes. Is there video footage of this? No, no. Like when a, when a, when a mother is like, "What sound does the pig make?" Oh, I see. And you know, we say "oink." Well, they don't say that. They I, say "oot." I'm so let down. Yeah. Because I thought the animal was Y'all, making the yeah. noise. <laughs> Yeah, you're and, telling me that. A, and then in France, the dogs go gaff gaff with a French accent. They go ha ha ha. But I'm just saying, I thought when you said that, I thought, well, you know, I don't know, maybe, maybe the dogs <laughs> don't say gaff. You can see where Bernie Zoo would be a lot more difficult if you had to internationalize it. That's right. It's the, it's the, yeah. So anyway. I'm sorry I interrupted that story. Listen. <laughs> the fox had to get out there. Don't let the, don't hide the truth. Oh. So anyway, this is going to wrap it up, Aaron, for this week's Amiga News. What a, what a week it's been for Amiga News. Oh, yeah, yeah. You got that right. What's been going on over at the old community update section? Well, just real quick, we're going to buzz through these. We had a couple releases this week. Uh, myself and Boat uh, did a little thing called R. Sinclair where we talked about Super Hang On. Mm-hmm. We enjoyed it. And then we also, myself and Brent, I will say I enjoyed this week. It's the Daewoo Zemex V CPC 51. The V Straight stands for victory. And and Zemex stands for like real fun or yeah. something. So yeah. I trouble. really wanted to be on that show. I could have shared many a uh, hilarious Korean story. I agree. I agree. I, I, mean, I did use some of your I did. You, I enjoyed I that. Some of your stick. And uh, I want to plug. I watch this lot like Sprite Castle. Rob plays and can de- Rob plays Karatika and defeats it. Upside down. Mm-hmm. That's all I got to say. It's a, that, That's on the Amiga stream team this week. All right, Aaron. What do we got coming up next week? Oh, man. Brace yourself, Boat. Boom. Boom. Whoop. You got to get the flash of gay sign. <laughs> it's Amiga thon. If there's anything that's related to criminal activity, it's, it's Amigathon. <laughs> so Amigathon, Aaron, this is Amigathon seven or eight. I can't remember how many Amigathons oh, we've man. done at this Gosh, point. That many, eh? But uh, it is going down this Saturday, February eighteenth, uh, in Amigo Studios. Join Aaron and I and the Brent mm-hmm. starting at eight a.m. Eastern time. We will be playing Amiga games for twelve straight hours, including the inaugural. It's the same thing happens every. You got to tune in right at eight if you want to see Aaron finally beat the oh first level God. of Lionheart. We're, we're, we're bringing that set. We're bring, Does listen, that mean I got set down and watch you play Adam's Family again this year? Then I'm going to beat the entire Adam's oh Family game. Oh my God. Yep. I'll be coming in with a bottle. I'll put it that <laughs> way. It should be fun. By the way, we're going to get it. We're going to play some Budokan. Oh yeah. For sure. We're going to play some multiplayer stuff. Mm-hmm. Maybe we'll have to play some of the games or some other ones they haven't tried out. It's going to be 12. we got plenty of time. There'll be Barbie games, Chris. Don't worry. Oh man. I don't know. Do Amiga have any Barbie games? Sure. It does. does it's got it? tons of them. I don't, I don't know either. I don't think it does. What the look? All right. So please join us if you will. Go to amigathon.com for all the info you need. This is a this is benefiting Children's Miracle Network Hospitals. Since 2017, we have raised over ten thousand dollars for that awesome, awesome cause. And right now, uh, we are up over a thousand dollars raised. We want to give a special shout out to uh, Amigathon's official sponsor, Retro Rewind, for matching the first five hundred dollars of donations that came in. Uh, and uh, like I said, you can tune in and throw in a couple bucks for a great cause and enjoy the Amiga goodness. And feel good about things. That's because right. Because we got to help out the kids, too. That's right. That's right. All right. As we come to the end of our show, Aaron, we want to, of course, say a thank you to all of our Patreon supporters. If you like what you've heard and you want to throw us a couple bucks, head on over to patreon.com slash Amigos Podcast. We want to thank all the fine folks that watch us live on Twitch. We record live on Twitch every Friday around 5 o'clock. Twitch.tv slash Amigos Retro Gaming. We leave you, Aaron, with a special video that I cut together. You're going to see a little bit of every uh, every fighter's uh, um, CV, every fighter's resume, and a little bit, a little clip from each fighter in the Budokan tournament. Very so good, we hope you enjoy this. Thank you, as always, for listening. We will see you next time. And until then, adios. adios.